Okay, I am so excited about this conversation. I have on the show today the one and only Dr. Esau McCauley. Esau has a PhD in, in the New Testament under the supervision of the world-renowned New Testament scholar N.T. Wright. He is a theologian. He's a biblical scholar. He's a professor, um, and he's an Anglican priest and just an all-around super, super smart and engaging guy. He's also releasing uh, a book called Reading While Black. I want to make sure I get the subtitle right. Um, the info is in the, sub, in, the, in the description below. Reading While Black, African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope that will be published on September 1st of this year, just in a few weeks, uh, depending on when this video is released. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. We talk about all kinds of stuff from... Um, uh, from racial racial reconciliation in the scriptures to current race conversations going on today. We talked about Ephesians. We talked about Pauline theology. We talked about all kinds of things because this dude is super smart. If you don't know Esau, I'm super, super excited for you to get to know him in this conversation. So please welcome to the show the one and only Esau McCulley. Hey friends, I'm here with Dr. Esau McCauley. Esau is a biblical scholar, did a PhD under N.T. Wright, and is also an Anglican priest. He's a man of the church. He's a man of uh, the academy. And he wrote a recent, uh, well, forthcoming book called Reading While Black. Or is it Reading the Bible While Black or Reading While Black? Which one is it, Esau? Reading While Black, African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. I, I like to give one piece of advice to um, future authors out there. If you have a, a long subtitle that you're really excited about, mm -hmm. every time people ask you about the book, you have to say that entire long subtitle. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to keep saying African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope, which I actually think is important, but um, it's just it's a lot. It's a mouthful. So Reading While Black, yeah. African-American interpretation as an exercise in hope. So I want to dive into that, but actually I'm now fascinated with the title, Reading While Black, and then you say African American. A lot of white people are saying, especially now we're all sensitive to the race conversation, most of us are trying to get it right, I think. Is it black or is it African American? What do, what do we say? Or does it depend on the context? I mean, there hasn't been a black committee meeting to kind of adjudicate this issue, but I think that um, black can refer to you know a variety of people and so when I African American in the subtitle actually points out that I'm talking about African Americans, not people um, in Nigeria, Rwanda. So black can kind of right. encompass, you know, people in the UK. So I made sure that I, I, I highlighted that this is coming particularly from um, African Americans. Okay. So somebody, but it's okay to say black, referring. It, it, you seem to specify people who are black who have lived the American experience as. A person of color is that um yeah i mean like i call myself black all of the time they're just synonyms but i just right. okay. I, the reason is it's in the title like that reading while african-american didn't sound as good so reading while black just sounded it flowed off the tongue okay. it was similar to it comes from the sorry the book title comes from the standard um thing called driving while black Oh, okay. And that speaks about the, uh, the the disproportionate amount of times African Americans are pulled over by the police, and and so people talked about you know why did you get pulled over? And you said, well, I was just driving while black. And so if you if you in the black community you've heard that phrase driving while black, and so um, reading while black was kind of a play okay. on that idea. Okay. Okay. All right. Give us the gist of this book, man. I mean, already sounds fascinating. I'm sure it's going to ruffle some feathers. And from what I've seen how you are on social media. You, you don't mind kicking up a little dust. I think that's good. Um, tell us what this book's all about, man. Well, I don't try to be provocative. I just try to do as best. Every Christian I think is doing as best as they can to tell the truth as they understand it. Mm -hmm. And if I'm wrong, hopefully I am correctable. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason that I wrote the book is what I wanted to do, I can put it this way. Um, when I first um, wanted to go to seminary, I wanted to get my MDiv and go back and be a pastor in my community. So the idea was I need to go to seminary, learn all of this stuff, and then take that stuff back to the community that I served. But one of the things that happened to me is that when I got to seminary, I recognized how little the seminary or even like white Christians in general mm -hmm. understood about the community that shaped me. 
And because they didn't understand the community that they shaped me, they often misdiagnosed the things that we needed to hear and see and do. And so it was hard to be trained by a place that didn't, didn't understand the community. And so I found myself at seminary oftentimes explaining black Christianity to um, white evangelicalism. But I also found myself saying, like, there are very few resources that I think are um, directly oriented towards the community that I wanted to serve. So basically, I wrote the book to, like, young me. Like, what would I have needed when I was 22 to 25 years old, going through seminary, looking for a way of Bible reading that was relevant to the community that shaped me? So oftentimes, if you think about, like, these application um, uh commentaries that we have. Yeah. But most of them are applied to kind of white middle class suburban churches because most of the past, most of people who write these commentaries write them to that community. So when they think about how does this apply, they're not thinking about how does this apply to a 19-year-old black kid who's transitioning from an all-black high, high school to a white college mm. or a working class black guy who's just trying to take care of his family. When I was when I was in when I was taking my preaching classes, they talked about whenever you write a sermon, you have to populate the room with certain people. So you got to think about how is this person going to hear it? How is this person going to hear it? If you want the sermon to be effective. And so what I realized is so little biblical scholarship was populated. The exegesis was oriented towards the people in the communities that I served, that I, that I was a part of. And so reading while black was an attempt to serve that community, but also at the same time show to demonstrate to the academy, its own blind spots, the kinds of things that they aren't even asking or the kinds of things they aren't, they aren't considering. So in the first and foremost, it's not, it's not a book. And a lot of people kind of want black people to explain black people to white people. So it's like, here's how to understand blackness. But this is not this book. The book is not written to white Christians to explain blackness to them, a black faith. Okay. It's actually written to the black community trying as best as I can to say, here's the way in which we can be faithful Christians in this generation through the practice of Bible reading. Can, can you get that? No, that's helpful. I, that, that was my question is who is the audience? Is it trying to help white people out or trying to address uh, specifically black? People? No, it's like it is, it is written. It is written to African-American okay. Christians. But here's the, here's the important part about that. One, sometimes I like to tell this story. When my um, when, when we and my wife first got married, we were in the military. And we got stationed abroad in Japan and I was not working. I was staying home with our, with the kids. Um, and she was off doing her military stuff. She's a Navy doc. And so I started going to the like stay at home parents activities, but it was mostly women. And at first they were trying to make some kind of allowances for me saying, Oh, you know, you know, they were trying to say, but after a while they kind of said, you know what? It's too much work to like make the exception for Esau. We're just going to talk about like what it's like to be a Navy wife. So like the events were like moms and tots. And yeah. I remember this one time they was, we need to get our, and, but this is their description. So don't, don't yell at me. Don't like, we need to get our bikini bodies ready. I was like, you know what? I don't have a bikini body and I don't know if this is my move, but I, but what it did is that it gave me an insight. And even like when we would sit around at the um, at the playground, they would no longer make exceptions to me. And so I actually got to say, how do women actually talk when they are no longer concerned with men's presence? And my one male, my as one male, I was not significant to make them adjust the conversation. Mm. So what I what I like to say is they're like sitting in on a conversation in which you're not the center of the conversation is also informative. Because yeah. when I speak to a majority white audience, I'm always thinking to myself, how much of this can they take before this is too much emotionally for them? So there's always this filter that's going on, or at least because you're in that setting, it's like the power dynamics are off. But if you're in a black room, Right. The entire conversation is different because they're not making allowances for you and you're sitting in and you will learn more. Because I will tell you this. There's a lot of crazy things that people will say in an all white room mm -hmm. that they won't. I'm talking about like a white pastor. You take that exact same person and you put him in a room full of 50 black pastors yeah. and see if, if, the, if his personality doesn't change. Huh. And so the important thing that I want to say is that like one of the good things about reading my black is it allows you to as best as I can invite you into the room to hear the con the kinds of conversation we're asking. And here's another here's the another analogy that I use. Some people will say, well like, why would you even talk about biblical interpretation as it relates to race in, in these different rooms? But I will tell you this. 
every single pastor does this. So when a pastor has a text in front of him and he's thinking, how does this text speak to married couples, right? And you're thinking, okay, if I'm if I'm in a room full of married couples, I'm going to preach this text one way. If I'm preaching to, you know, 18 to 22 year olds who are thinking about entering relationships, I'm going to bring out these aspects of the text. If I'm preaching to a youth group, I'm going to preach it a little bit differently. And in each one of, or if you move from a city, mm-hmm. right, to a rural area, yeah. you're going to preach differently. So all of these things, it's not that it's changing the, the, the truth of the text, right? The text has a truth, mm-hmm. but the way that truth is, 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 is applied varies by community. And when we talk about that, no one gets mad, right? No one says, like, how does, how does like, Ephesians 2 speak to parenting? It's not controversial. How does Ephesians 2 speak to how African Americans engage in the world then becomes controversial? So when I'm talking about reading while black, I'm talking about the cons questions that African Americans bring to the biblical text that are distinct from the kinds of questions that white Christians might bring to the text because they've had different experiences. Now, what makes this still kind of, a I mean, so like we're all influenced by our circumstances and our surroundings, and these impact the kinds of questions that we yeah. ask. But it doesn't mean that God's word isn't allowed to speak back to us, right? right. Read why black, blackness informs the question, right? We still allow God to like give us the answer. Yeah. And so what we're talking about, it, it, but here's the thing though, sometimes because of the community that you are in, you will ask the wrong kinds of questions of the text. And sometimes someone from a different community can help you see a blind spot that you hadn't seen before. So here, here's a paradigmatic example. Here's the yeah. paradigmatic example. Slavery. Yeah. And you can talk about this. You can look at it. You can look at it. This is what happened. You had um, uh, the pro-slavery faction was saying, okay, here's this Timothy passage. Here's this other text. They say, okay, therefore, we can enslave people for you know these reasons. It's also rooted in kind of a faulty anthropology. And another thing that was happening was, well, because African Amer- Africans are deficient humans— they need kind of slavery and kind of Western pedagogy to bring them up because of their kind of inherently inferior state. So there was two exegetical flaws. One was the faulty anthropology, mm-hmm. and the second was a, a myopic focus on a few Pauline texts. Mm-hmm. So why, why did they make these exegetical mistakes that are clear to us right now? Because their social location as their privileged class mm-hmm. did, sent them to the Bible with the question of how can I support the exploitation of other people? It was greed rooted in their 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 their, their place in society that distorted how they read the Bible. Yeah. The the initial the, the initial African American encounter with the Bible, as it relates to the same context, is saying, well, hold on. In this passage, here, Genesis 1, 26 to 28 says that all humanity is made in God's image. Now That was in the white master's Bible. But what the black Christian said is the implications of this text for black people is your anthropology is wrong. So the social location of African-Americans who are being oppressed caused them to use a biblical doctrine to push back on a particular form of heresy. Mm -hmm. And they asked the question, what does Genesis 126 to 28 say about blackness precisely because they were in a location Mm -hmm. in which blackness was being expected? Yeah. Then they said, well, hold on. You have passages like 1 Timothy and here and there. But there's this huge chunk of the Bible called the Exodus, mm-hmm. where God seems to take pleasure in liberating people. And this idea about God as liberator appears over and over and over in the Bible. And so this is what the black Christian said. God's character is most clearly revealed in these acts of liberation. So Exodus becomes a metaphor for Christian salvation, right? Freedom from sin. And so there's something about God's desire to free things that you see throughout the entirety of the Bible. And so their social location, once again, caused them to say, canonically, the picture of God that emerges from reading the Bible as a whole shows you that as a Christian, you should be against slavery. Both of those were were ideas that were that were articulated in the way that they were because they were African Americans whose first question was the first question does the Bible support what happened to us and so socially located reading doesn't out 
doesn't eclipse the biblical text. It is simply an, I mean, it is simply an honest assessment of the fact that we bring our questions to the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Someone, and so what I'm saying is like, what African American biblical interpretation refers to are the ways in which the experience, the collective experiences of being black in America, mm-hmm. have shaped the kinds of questions that we bring to the text, and. It talks about the particular ways in which the text challenges us, mm-hmm. because every single culture has um, ways in which the Bible is a particular challenge. And so let me, and this this is once again a a, a pretty basic example. I'll talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness is like a basic biblical idea. You know, someone sins against you, you forgive them. It's part of what it means to be a Christian. Yeah. But you look at like forgiveness from like the two sides of the black white divide. Mm-hmm. The white Christians are effectively like receiving their forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And the black Christian is the one who's having to process all that's happened to us in America and what continues to happen and what continues to be denied. And so the African-American in this context who's having to deal with forgiveness is doing different kinds of emotional work. It's the same kind of, of emotional work that a survivor is trying to like deal with, right? A survivor of abuse. And so, when we talk about forgiveness, we work, we're doing different kinds of theological work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not that no one has to forgive. You see, you see what I mean? So yeah, yeah. like no, yeah. Christians say you should like forgive in this particular dynamic. Is it the same now? You, so the ways in which the gospel in particular challenges different communities means there's certain kinds of questions that, that, that we're going to have to answer in a different way if we're going to be faithful. And so I can't speak to all of the ways in which the, the truths of Christianity particularly press on the culture. But we, we can even talk about like the ways in which individualism, like American individualism, mm-hmm. functions to keep, to kind of push back on any kind of corporate responsibility in white Christian settings. Yeah. And so, not, so what I want to say is this, there is an exegetical motivation against corporate responsibility because corporate responsibility in a white Christian context requires certain kinds of like added burden, right? So there's this idea of like, I'm at all complicit in anything that happened before I was born. Mm -hmm. Then that puts a lot of weight. So like, there's an exegetical motivation not to see those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is that like, it's the Bible as God's word comes to a different communities, but the ways in which it challenges and pushes back and transforms each culture is as varied as the culture. And that when you get all of these cultures together reading the Bible, right, that's how you get to the truth. Mm-hmm. Because I need a Ugandan or a Nigerian to come and say, here's some American blind spots. Mm-hmm. I might need my Asian American brothers and sisters to say, here's some things that you might not see because you're so caught up in the black white binary. And so, what I'm talking about is literally the entire body of Christ reading the Bible together so that we might properly understand it. Yeah. And since I can't speak all of the ways in which other cultures read the Bible and the questions that they ask, I could talk about the ways in which my culture reads the Bible and the kinds of questions that we ask. And so this is what I'm trying to like contribute to the the conversation around the truth of God's word. That, oh man, I've got about 18 different questions that are running through my, uh, first of all, it just makes me want to read your book more. And if, if it means anything, I just want to 100%, 100% affirm that the Bible can be absolute truth. And yet our access, our interpretive process by which we access that absolute truth is colored by gender, socioeconomic status, ethnicity, power dynamics, geographical location, e- even temporal. Like we are living in a, we read it as post enlightenment readers and that, that plays a role too. denomination. I mean, there's so many intricate layers yes. that color doesn't Every- mean our interpretation is wrong or right. It just means we have lenses on, we all have lenses on, right? And the only thing I'm doing is I'm being honest about my lens. Yeah, yeah. And 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 just actually, it'd be funny to be honest. I'm, that's only one of the lenses. So uh, one of the things I do when I teach New Testament, and the students laugh because when we, when we go through the Bible, I tell the, I kind of point out Christians when this is their moment. So we get to Ephesians like one and two. I say, okay, Calvinists, here you go, and like they all perk up because God's sovereignty <laughs> over human affairs, right? Or when we get to Acts, I'm like, okay, Pentecostals, you know, here, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Or we get to the Gospels. You know, here's my personal relationship with people, with Jesus' people. We get to the Sermon on the Mount, mm-hmm. our ethicist. Every tradition, 
right? Anglicans feel like we really believe, we really believe, we really believe that we like invented Advent and Christmas. I know we think that we do, like nobody does it like we do, right? So we know well, like when, when it's baby Jesus time, John 1, the Anglicans kind of rise up. <laughs> When it's time for like atonement theory, he comes to Presbyterians. Because yeah. every text, every tradition yeah. has these set of texts that becomes the lens through which we read the Bible. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because, okay, absolutely. like Ephesians 1 and 2 is like my hermeneutical center and everything else. Like I'm going to explain Hebrews in light of Ephesians and Romans. Yeah. And so what I want to say is that like that tradition the tradition is like good because it keeps us from like changing week in and week out but also as people who are committed to turn returning to god's word over and over again in the search of truth sometimes those traditions can be um limiting in certain ways and so just because i'm doing african-american biblical interpretation it doesn't mean that i'm right it doesn't mean that everything that we say is right i'm just being honest about my influences that so uh, the whole idea of like inter you know personal devotions, interpreting the Bible on your own, you know, you and God, you and God, you and your Bible, which I am not, I would never have discounted individual Bible reading, but you're saying, I think you're saying, and I would hundred percent agree that we absolutely need to interact with the text, interpret the text in a diverse community. Um, because we are, if all we do is read it through our lens, we are, we're, we're going to be, bl we're going to have, everybody's going to have blind spots until they, are challenged. And even if they're challenged, they have to be open to being challenged too. just sitting in a room with a bunch of diverse yeah. people interpreting the Bible isn't going to do anything, but frustrate people. If, if, if we're not willing to admit that yes. we all are bringing lenses and, and biases to the text, would, would that, so be let, let me, let me, let me give a couple more examples. Mm -hmm. Anyone who studied the reformation knows that part of explaining what happened with Luther's formation of his theology is by the particular um, ex excesses that were going on in Germany. Mm -hmm. And so Luther is not just responding to Catholicism like as a, as a kind of global entity. He's in particular dealing with the particular extremes of the nuances that were happening in Germany. And so what was happening in Germany influences kind of the, the, the trajectory of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And most people will talk about how Calvin's Geneva influences him. And so all of us recognize that like we are influenced by our context. It doesn't mean that Calvin and Luther were wrong no. simply because they were in those places, but those places help you understand the things that Calvin and Luther said. Now the problem is, and if you've ever, you've ever been, you, you've done um, academic formal research. The problem is once you have one idea mm -hmm. that is kind of established, Sometimes people will just uncritically follow that same idea. And part of getting a dissertation is, here's how you get a PhD. You just find something that everybody said because somebody said it a long time ago and no one went back and read the, the data. And you go back and say, hold on, when I go back to this data, this idea is wrong. And so someone stands up and goes, hey, this idea that we've all been building upon, this foundation is flawed. And because we're all kind of thinking in the same way, sometimes they need someone who's from the outside to go, hey, look at it this way. And so when we talk about why you need diverse interpreters, it is because sometimes we get in the habit of doing things. As an Anglican, we have our kind of liturgical calendar and we have our sacraments. We have this entire structure in which we're saying, this is how you follow Jesus. And Anglicans can sometimes be a little bit removed, right? We can kind of be a little bit stayed and not as, you know, evangelistic. So we need every now and then our non-denominational brother and sister to come in with their head on fire, talking about we need to do what we can to help people, introduce people to God. <laughs> and, 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 but here's the thing though, the, our, they, they can sometimes like in, in the global body, they can kind of inject Anglicanism with kind of the, the free church chaos, Right. And I mean chaos in a good sense, like innovative chaos. But here's the other thing that you're also seeing happen. You're also seeing more non-denominational churches begin to adopt some of the liturgical practices. When I was in high school, nobody was talking about, no Baptist was talking about Advent <laughs> and Lent. But it's much more common in non-denominational spaces. Yeah. Because they said that like there's something in the Anglican tradition that is actually good for the wider body of Christ. Yeah. So we need each other. We need each other to kind of get towards the truth. Yeah. And so I do think that if you have, if you, if you exist in a singular community, mm -hmm. then unless that singular community is like uniquely insightful, then that community is going to have blind spots and you need to sometimes have someone from outside the community to help you, 
help you kind of form it. All Christianity is this large conversation across time and culture about the nature of the Christian witness. Mm-hmm. So even if you go back, sometimes reading the fathers and church fathers and mothers, it's helpful for, for understanding the modern day because they're not caught up in our kind of particular sets of circumstances. Yeah. One of the things that, you, for example, as much as Paul talks about um, salvation by grace and salvation by faith, all of the things that he talks about how God's salvation is a gracious gift, Paul is not at all uncomfortable telling you need to do stuff to be saved, right? <laughs> Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, like he tells you to like do these good works that God has prepared for you in advance to walk in. Now, when we preach those, we have to say the following. Yes, Paul says that like you need to do these good works that God has prepared in advance for you to walk in. But don't right. think that that means you have to earn your salvation because yeah. we're always afraid that someone's going to misunderstand it and turn into Pelagians. Uh-huh. Yeah. But Paul was super comfortable both saying yeah. you're saved apart from anything that you do in one chapter and three chapters later without any qualification say do A, B, and C if you love Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because he's not afraid, but be, because we're so we're so in, influenced by the Reformation binary, mm-hmm. we're always protecting people from becoming Pelagians. That's our biggest fear. <laughs> and mean, that wasn't isn't, isn't, there, isn't there something yeah. to the fact that we have a fourfold diverse gospel witness to, to Christ and not just one gospel? Doesn't that show that God's not afraid of different angles and slants and perspectives? And I mean, or even like um, when I was studying in Aberdeen, one of my fellow students um he, he was doing his doctoral work on the general epistles on it from a canonical canonical perspective and he said the very canonical placement of the general epistles um hebrews through what jude or whatever yeah or revelation i guess um it was almost it, well, it was almost designed to be an added corrective maybe that's too strong of a term an a- added complement to paul you know um and this is why like the very yeah. tension we see between romans 3 james 2 between some statements in Hebrews and Paul's letters, like that's actually intentional. We didn't want, it's not, it's not like Paul's the primary voice and his emphasis on divine agency. And, or even like, I mean, even acknowledge that even within Paul, there's diversity, but let's just say, let's just understand Paul through a Lutheran lens. Even if we do that, um, we shouldn't go the Lutheran route and say, therefore James is kind of a right straw epistle or there's these problems over yeah, there in the general I, letters, you know, like those aren't problems. I, those are think, absolutely necessary uh, compliments to Paul's emphasis on salvation by faith. Yeah. I think, I think my Lutheran scholars are going to say that, you know, that was one offhanded statement by Luther, but he, I don't think he, I don't like Luther actually want to kick James out. I've read something about that. Okay. What I would say is that like the Bible when I talk about, so when you think about the Gospels, let's just kind of stick with the Gospels. Mm-hmm. We think about like the, the the Jesus who emerges in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not in contradiction with one another. Right. Then it's the same Jesus, but they bring out facets of his personality mm-hmm. or facets of who Jesus is that are relevant both for the culture of the time in that community they're writing to, but also in the providence of God to the body of Christ. So that God intended to use a variety of writers who had a variety of interest to give the not even the fullness of who Jesus is, because even like, with the fourfold gospel, there's something about Jesus that like still eludes us, right? He's still like we don't we have we don't have he's not bound by those four stories, he's or those four narratives. He's even more than that, right? That Jesus is is even with those four different portraits, there's something about God that can't be fully articulated. There's this um the passage, in, forgive me, this is my working on Ephesians. Paul talks about having the strength to know um, the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding. Mm. So Paul's like idea is, I want to pray that you have the strength to know the ultimately unknowable, because yeah. God is beyond anything we can define. And so, yes, I don't think that any community, any community has a, a, um, a, what do you want to call it, a corner on the truth, such that they can say, we have no need of you. Mm-hmm. And that the body of Christ is supposed to be um, one people under the Lordship of Christ across different cultures. Then we need those cultures to fully understand um, and apply who uh, what God would have his people do and be. Yeah, that's good. I, hey, I want to go back to, there's a question I had about uh, old blind spots. Um, you you spent a lot of time right in white evangelical. Well, just in white evangelicalism as a whole. Um, you know that world. Yes. What, what are 
What are some other blind spots you've seen? I mean, because you, you, you know, the slavery one, I guess most people are like, oh, yeah, I totally get that. What, what are some that maybe um, stereotypically white evangelicals might be more blind to that, that, you know? Yeah, I always, I always, I always say some because people will say this doesn't describe me. So right. I can't speak to every single like white Christian. I would say that in general, there is, and this is what I see a lot of students struggle with. There is, and this actually influences like our biblical interpretation. But if, and I always get the quadrilateral wrong. So if, if evangelicalism is is emphasis on um, the cross, crucif- cruciformism, yeah. um, the need for evangelism, personal salvation, um, uh, I forget I forget all four of them. Whatever the four yeah. Bevington quad- quadrilaterals are. I always say there's kind of two unspoken ones um, that don't often get articulated. One is kind of like a a gentleman's agreement not to be too critical of the United States. So there's this idea that there's a strong link between their faith and kind of American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we're – and so there's such that criticisms of America – sometimes feel almost like criticisms of Christianity, mm-hmm. especially if it's criticisms of an early era of American history. So right right now, people will say, okay, you know, because of abortion or whatever, that America is in a rough state now. But they, they, they hearken back to the golden ages of like the 50s and the 60s. What I want to say is that like, America never had like the gold, what people call the golden age before the moral, the supposed moral decline of America is during the era of segregation. And so when black people were less free, people say, well, this is the golden era. Now that black people have, have, have more freedoms, there's like, there's a moral decline. And so what I want to say is that like, so when you start talking about like the, the history of oppression, if you go back from the founding of the country, so if you tell the story this way, America was, you know, founded by the exploitation of, of the Native Americans, the, the enslavement of black people through the exploitation of Asian Americans on the Western part of the country, um, as it relates to kind of uh, the theft of parts of the Southwest through um, the, con- the war with Mexico, up through what happened with African Americans during post Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and you say all of those things, people say, well, well, do- are you grateful to be here? And how can you like so like that that narrative mm-hmm. makes people think that you must be a theological liberal for having what they consider a heretical reading of American history. Yeah. And so what separates African-American churches and white evangelical churches is oftentimes not theological in the sense of it's different readings of American history. But the other part that's related to that is that there's an evolutionary way of telling this story. Mm-hmm. And when I say evolutionary, is that like, the idea was that, yes, America did these bad things. Now we evolved to this new place where we're now these freedoms are here. And so if you just give us more time, we will continue to give you freedom. So you should be patient. And so this, this idea that African American, the people struggling for justice should always be patient. Mm -hmm. And so when you appear to be impatient and critical, regardless of your other theological beliefs, Mm -hmm. you're sometimes pushed to the side in evangelicalism. Yeah. And now I don't want to make it seem this this in this one to talk about complex ideas. Two things can be true at the same time. It can be true that America has made tremendous progress over its history, but it is also true to say that existing problems still remain, and the progress that have been made is no ex, no excuse for patience because in every single generation, African American Christians have been told to be patient. The what to the slave is the Fourth of July. The the sermon that Frederick Douglass gives. Or the message that he gives is a criticism. He's like, look, you guys are having all of these cele- these celebrations, but how can you have these celebrations with black people still experiencing these oppressions? And people said at the time, how can he possibly be so critical? Because he should be happy that he's free and that America's moving towards this gen- this place. The other one that you can see is if, if you read Frederick Douglass's speech when they dedicated the monument to Lincoln after his assassination, and rather than just being um, laudatory for Lincoln. He criticizes Lincoln for being so halting in the freeing of black people. And people said, how can you possibly stand here, Frederick, when we're literally putting up a monument to Lincoln and criticize him? You should be grateful. So the assumption of the requirement for black gratitude at every single step is one of these kinds of things that then, then 
influences how we see black claims on justice, right? So when black Christians say, hear all of these passages in the Bible about how we should care about the poor and the foreigner. Hear all of these things that Jesus says. Well, you're distracting us from the main message. You should just talk about Jesus and then kind of let America's evolutionary ethic take its place. This is how these two things work together, right? Uh, so you don't got to talk about it. You just convert me and converting me would solve the problem. But then the African-American said, well, hold on. We've had we've had white Christians for centuries. And what what the what has to happen is that and I, and I don't want to make this to be misunderstood. Yes, the gospel addresses all of these issues. The gospel addresses ethnic enmity. But what the but what the gospel what, what you have to do as a, as a pastor is disciple people through the preaching of the entirety of the Bible. So, yes, the implications of Christ's death for all means there are there should be no racial hierarchy. But people aren't going to intuit that. So you have to explain to them, here's how the Christian message and all of the other passages in the Bible speaks to how people should be treated. So the gospel has to be discipled into a praxis. Mm -hmm. And we do that, discipling the gospel into a praxis in all kinds of other areas. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we're all saved, you know, this is how we should be married. But this is this is exactly how you parent. This is how you treat your wife. We give We give detailed examples. So what I'm saying is that as it relates to justice, the emphasis on salvation and piety and the and the blocking off of all of these passages is an exegetical blind spot of evangelicals rooted in their some evangelicals rooted in their understanding of American history. Mm -hmm. Don't talk about these things, just preach the gospel and trust in America's evolutionary goodness. When in every case, America has never just randomly come to the conclusion that this is what they should do. It's been by being publicly challenged and pushed back on and saying what you're doing. It's not keeping in keeping with your stated beliefs. So that conflict has to become explicit, not yeah. implicit. So you're saying like a, a white individual's um, association with the corporate white experience in America is a blind spot for how we maybe de-emphasize or, or even just flat out blind to maybe the gospel or the, the biblical, I would say, emphasis on issues of social justice um, and so on, where somebody reading the Bible from a corporate black experience is going to be much, much more in tune to the many passages that that are kind of this dichotomy between I'm just going to preach Jesus, not do the. Yeah. It's just such a false. Like, if you're going to preach the biblical Jesus, you yes. are preaching somebody who, in part, was addressing loads of social, even racial um, issues and tensions of his day. Yeah the the question the question that that I would ask and I don't I don't speak about like I'm not a white like evangelical cause I can't speak to like what they do you know what white evangelicals do corporately I can tell I can talk about what I see as patterns of behavior and I would say that like for example we don't like there are certain issues that evangelicals this, this is the example and I hate to give like really provocative examples but this is the best one that I've been able to around, think of, man. and I can, can uh, be as provocative. As so you want. I, we, we 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 talk about no. I'm saying like I just don't like to trigger people. So we talk about something like pornography, and we say that you know pornography is dangerous to society. It wrecks marriage and it's harmful to children. Mm -hmm. And sure, one way to solve the problem of pornography is to change the heart of the individual people making the exploitative fr fr films, right? So you can preach the gospel to the individual director, writer, and producer, and hope that that person becomes a Christian, changes his behavior, and stops making the films. But until we have the opportunity to change that person's heart, we try to put in place laws that protect society from the most from the from the damaging effects of these things, right? So we say, you know what? We don't want this easily accessible, so we're going to put these boundaries around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we understand as it relates to pornography, that there is both an individual ministry to people right. yeah. and laws and structures in society that we need to change to protect people while we go about our business. And in one way, we care, but we don't care about the person's heart while we do that, right? We don't say, you know, we just need to focus on the pornographer's heart. No, no, we say we need to protect people. And then hopefully we change their heart too. So as it relates to racism, we can't simply say that's when we that's when we go into heart theology. 
But what we have is a is a skin problem, not a you know whatever the phrase is, a skin problem, not a sin a sin problem, not a skin problem. So we're saying what we need to do is change individual centers. Yes, change individual centers. But while we're changing individual centers, let's look at the structures in society that allow these centers to exploit black and brown people. Right. And so it's only in this context. It's really only in this context, because you, you talk about like all of the times which people say, you know what. I see this thing, this Super Bowl commercial that I don't like, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get Christians everywhere to boycott it because I don't like this image, you know, that I'm having to see. So we're gonna organize to change this thing. So what I'm saying is we do this, Christians do this mm-hmm. in other areas, yeah. but when it comes to racism and injustice, yeah. they go, you know what? Let's just focus on the heart. Yeah. And that's what I want to call as exegetically inconsistent. Because yeah. if Christians can can argue their 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 issues in the public square, they can argue about issues related to racism. Yeah. And when we talk about how materialism and greed and covetousness exist in every structure of society, and we try to fight we fight against it, not controversial. We talked about sexual exploitation. We don't say let's just change the hearts. We say let's change the hearts and change the laws to make it more difficult. Yeah. We think about all the ways in which we protect people in our society arise from our Christian faith. But it's ra- the question is, why is injustice the category that is limited to the human heart and not structures yeah, in society? Yeah, yeah. And why is it that the people, the people who push back on it are the exact same, shouldn't say the exact same people, some of them are still alive, who push back on the civil rights laws? Wow. Right? That, that if you look back on, you can, you can look back and see it at the time. There's never been a time when an African-American Christian who's pushing for justice has been a popular amongst white Christians. Martin Luther King, they say, was doing more damage to black people than helping. Look at the opinion polls. He was never loved during his lifetime. Neither was Frederick Douglass. Neither was John Lewis. They're always criticized for being too provocative. They die. Their story is edited down to manageable points and then decontextualized quotes are then put to the fore. Here's an example. Martin Luther King. People say all of the time, like, you know, I, I don't want to be judged by the color of my skin or the content of my character. And that Martin Luther King has advocated um, uh, as this kind of colorblind theologian. But he also says black people need to be able to say, I am black and I am proud. But I don't see people quoting that part of Martin Luther King's talk. Martin Luther King talks about how every black man needs to write in his own heart, his own emancipation proclamation in his soul. Mm -hmm. He says, I am black and I am somebody and God created my blackness and God made my blackness beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that king isn't quoted. Yeah. Because that's the king that no one liked. And so what I'm saying is that like, there has to be this place in which I, I've said this. I don't think there's been a, a group of Christians more consistently disbelieved about their experiences than black Christians telling white Christians these are the things that we're experiencing. Mm-hmm. And we're being told repeatedly, no, you're not, and it's not that bad, and what you're doing isn't helping. Mm-hmm. And we're being told that if we do it a different way, then maybe we will receive the help. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the problem is there's never been, never look, search in history there's never been a black Christian movement for justice that received the approval of the majority of white Christians. And as a matter of fact, since post-call Marx, every single time it's been done, they've been accused of communism. Every single time. So when you when you come to 200, 2020 and you hear black Christians saying, hey, here are the ways which we think the Bible speaks to the to the movement for justice in America, and we had we're called being excessively divisive, setting black people back, using the wrong kinds of language, and effectively being influenced by communism, is the exact same thing that's been leveled against African American Christians for a century whenever they've done it. Mm-hmm. And so you want to talk about a blind spot? There's a gaping blind spot. Mm-hmm. The, like really, like, the question you should be asking yourself is like, who is the black Christian? who I disagree with on issues of justice, who is not a communist, mm-hmm. right? So it feel like there's two categories, the black people who get it and communists. Like there is, there's not a category for, here's a black person talking about in, injustice in a way that I don't like, 
but I just disagree on the interpretation of the Bible. It always has to be created. They have to construct an entire worldview that black Christians have to justify not engaging. Because it's not even it's not even an exegetical argument, right? If you look what's going on right now, if the internet is any judge, there's not an exegetical engagement in here are the passages that African Americans are talking about, and with these caveats saying that these are how they should inform the Christian vision. And people are saying, here's how this exegesis is incorrect. What's actually happening is here's an entire worldview that explains why black Christians are saying what they're saying and why you don't have to listen to them. The lack of exegesis, the lack of serious engagement with biblical text is startling. Hmm. So I, yeah, I got a bunch of questions. Uh, (laughs) We're running out of time, man. Um, So and maybe it's because I run in maybe different circles, but it, in in my circles, and that would maybe include the the limited time I spend on social media, whatever, um, just paying attention to the broader Christian world. It seems like white evangelicals are just tripping over themselves to um, be anti-racist. And um, I mean, you have so many, I mean, yeah. literally millions of white Christians clamoring over Robin DiAngelo's just horrendously written book white fragility and others and it's like so I, it, it, so maybe, maybe it's because i swim in broader evangelical circle maybe there is a far right evangelical that is really pushing i just that's not my world so am i living in a small world yeah. or are white christian no i think i think i think i think that like this is this is another interesting question i think that there's a portion of evangelicalism that's changing okay and i think that it's a, a portion of younger evangelicals well, so, what I so want to say my, is maybe that's more my audience. That's yeah. yeah, yeah. But but I would also say, and I'm going to get in trouble for this one, but this is what do I care? <laughs> we have to be we have to be discerning. And what I want to talk about this is there's a lot of people who are talking about social justice, who have a variety of different theological frames. Mm-hmm. And you can say this way of talking about the the movement for justice is helpful and this part of the movement isn't helpful or this part of what they say is helpful and this part isn't helpful. The best analogy I've come up with to describe this is the Reformation. Mm -hmm. So out of the Reformation comes Lutherans, Calvinists, Anglicans, Anabaptists, Quakers, Shakers, all of these things. All of them were rooted in this singular idea about, you know, justification by faith. But it spread out into a variety of different practices, some of which were some of which were helpful and some of which weren't helpful. And as we step back from the Reformation, we can start to begin to tri- to to trace these different lines. And we were able to say, you know what, this part of what they were doing, I'm not going to go with. So like Luther might have been good here, but he had this huge problem with anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. Or we might say that like you know Calvin did this, but he did this part wrong. The Anglicans did everything right. No, just kidding. <laughs> and so what I'm saying is that as it relates to issues of the current move for justice, one of the things that I see some people doing is the exact same thing that like that the Catholics do to Protestants. They sit back and they look at the extremes and say, look, there's a thousand different denominations and look at this crazy thing that the Protestants did. Therefore, Protestantism is wrong. Mm-hmm. Full stop. Come and be a Catholic. And so what I see some people doing is looking over the entire discussion of justice in America and say, look, here, here, and here are extremes, and here are ways in which these things are destructive for Christian practices. Therefore, let's pull back from the entire conversation about justice. Hmm. And so what I want to say is, no, no, no. What you have to be able to do is to say, this, this, and this are bad appropriations, and here's a helpful one. And so what I would think that if I see one danger amongst some portion of white evangelicalism, is a lack of theological discrimination arising from excessive guilt. Yeah. And so yeah. one way to kind of one way to not be like your parents is to say, well, I'm going to be like super pro everything, like mm-hmm. anti-racist. And I'm going to take it all in. But what I want to say is that like you can't trade one extreme for the other. Mm-hmm. And there's a variety of African-American Christian voices and African-American voices more broadly. You should read all of them, but you should also discern the streams of the tradition, right? That the, just like there are streams of the African of the of, of, of kind of white Christianity, yeah. there's streams of black Christianity. Yeah. And I don't know how discerning um, like some white evangelicals are 
of these of these different streams and how and the nature of those conversations. And so it's going to take a while for them to understand kind of the clusters of ideas. Yeah. In the same way that it takes a while to kind of get the reform, like it takes a while to kind of get okay when this scholar in, in the Reformation is is dealing with this and following up on this idea and he's pushing back on this person. Yeah. And so what I want to say is that they, in the same way that you need to populate the room, even with Pauline scholarship, here's mm-hmm. here's an apocalyptic reading of Paul, here's a you know new perspective reading of Paul, here's an old perspective reading of Paul, mm-hmm. here's a radical new perspective on Paul, here's um, Paul within Judaism. Oh, you begin to populate all of those people to understand yeah. the conversation. What I want to say that in black Christianity and the movement for justice, you have to learn that the conversation is just as complex. And it can't just be as simple as let's just read all the black people and (laughs) put it all into a bowl and mix it out and come up with this kind of conflicting series of ideas. And so what I want to say is that sometimes you need to like read all the different things and keep your theological wits about you as you as you do that. There is this thing that I think is called historic Christianity that is not rooted in like whiteness and in white supremacy. And I think there's like, you can believe the creeds and the scriptures and the, and the, you know, Trinitarian theology and the dual nature of Christ. I don't think that's just like Western imperialism yeah. enforcing a, a, a distorted picture of Jesus on the world. So what I want to say is care about justice, but don't lose your head in that context. That's good, man. Can, can I ask you some for some pastoral advice? I mean, this is going to go on the record. I don't know how many people are listening to this, but I just this is really just I would almost ask this off offline. Um, and it, but it has to do exactly with what you're um, saying. So yeah. So what I've been trying to do, and I've, I've been I've been trying to engage the race conversation off and on for maybe fifteen years. So um, yeah, yeah, it was back in two thousand, I think five. A good friend of mine said, "Have you?" read the autobiography of Malcolm X yet. And I was like, and it was a yet. And I said, no, I'm, I'll, I grew up thinking he was just like the devil, you know, read that book, absolutely reconfigured how I even go about the race conversation, realized there's so much, just all the lenses stuff, all the stuff we talked about. And so I, I, it's been an interest of mine yeah. for a while. Um, and more recently, obviously I'm trying to get up to speed on some newer works. And so I've been trying to see, so I, it might be a longer question, but I, I've been trying to do exactly what you're saying, I think, of, of reading a, a range of reading a range of voices. I do when it comes to the race conversation, I do tend to prioritize um black intellectual voices. Um I, I'm reading white people too. I mean I again I read so he, <laughs> this is an interesting exercise. Uh reading these two books chapter by chapter back to back. <laughs> <laughs> I can see. I can only see one of them. White oh. fragility. I don't see the other one. So Shelby Steele, White guilt, and then uh, Beverly D'Angelo. Oh wait, okay. I think it's coming out. My f- camera's flipped. Anyway, one's yeah. you know white woke liberal woman. The other one's black intellectual scholar. They fundamentally disagree. Um, so I, I do. I do. I am reading some white scholarly voices. I do tend to prioritize black voices. But I, I'm seeing, especially in this kind of third wave of anti racism, that there's there's a diverse diversity of really interesting challenging perspectives and voices so from what what i'm trying to do is read widely formulate my opinions my thoughts my responses whatever a bit slower i think in the social media era everybody's just jumping on every little thing and i'm like exactly just like pauline scholarship if all of a sudden i read an nt right book and i was like oh my gosh and you're like whoa whoa hold on you, you gotta read francis watson and john barkley you have to read there people we go that, you know, like just hit pause. And, and I do understand there is an urgency to having a correct perspective on what's going on in America now. But there's, you don't also, I mean, it is way more complex than some of my white, woke, liberal, younger, typically Christian, often Christian friends make it out to be. Um, and I'm like, I just, just, I, I, I want to do a lot of listening, a lot of reading, a lot of thinking right now, prioritizing the diverse range of black, typically intellectual voices. Uh, that that's what I've been doing. Yeah. So you, as a pastor, how, tell tell me yes, no, yeah, but do this or maybe you know don't do yeah, that. Yeah, I, 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 I would say a couple of things. First of all, like um, like woke as an insult is like rooted in kind of a certain segment of evangelicalism that thinks like the ties those two things together. I, I'm using um, it neutrally, just so, so you know. I'm not trying to use. I it. know. Yeah. So uh, like, okay, liberal. Okay, so I guess I guess what I would say is, I tell people to stay in their lane. And this is what I mean. I'm a New Testament scholar. Yeah. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not an economist. So I try to say, 
I try to use things that are within my competence. And I try to limit myself to things that are like beyond my competence as far as speaking as an expert. And so when I talk about um, like racism and injustice, as best as I can, I'm speaking from like exegesis of the biblical text and my understanding of African-American Christian culture. And because of my long sojourn in evangelicalism, kind of an, an anecdotal understanding of evangelicalism. Some people actually have like a deep kind of Mark Knoll understanding of evangelicalism. So what I want to say to people is if you're not a sociologist, don't pretend to be one on the Internet. Um, and so I think that the Bible gives. And so this is not a Bible only like if I was a theologian, I would say like engage this from your discipline. So if you're a pastor you might want to say, given what I have, what can I say to my congregation that I know to be true? Mm. And then as you begin to expand your like understanding, then you can begin to kind of expand the, the nomenclature that you're able to understand, like to, to engage with. So like first thing I would say, like stay in your lane. And the second, so like there's like, I've never read Right Fragility and it's not on my reading list. You don't need to. And so, like, it's just like, I just don't, I have not read a lot uh, of critical race theory because that's, like, not necessarily directly tied to what I want to do as a biblical scholar. Now I'm learning about it because it's a part of the conversation and understanding, and I'm starting to kind of develop some kind of competences in that. But that doesn't mean, I, I, I for the most part, don't use a lot of critical race theory that I can consciously in my scholarship because I'm just not an expert on it. And so in the same way that people just can't, people can use the Bible, but to like jump in and go into a Pauline argument, you need to have really done your work or you're going to embarrass yourself. Mm-hmm. And in certain ways, it's similar that I can't like read. Like, and you can tell people who are like non-scholars who then just kind of sprinkle into biblical scholarship, which is fine. Yeah. But I expect for them a certain level of competence rooted in this is what their discipline is. They're talking about this area outside of their competence, so they should be appropriately chastened and humbled. One of the things that I find really interesting is how, how many people mash their whole like sections of thought in like two months and speak about it definitively yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the internet. It's like, dude, that didn't even exist. Like, you just you literally Googled it, read three or four other blogs, read like a couple of books, and put your spin on it. And so. What I want to say is like a little like theological and and a little humility wouldn't hurt. Yep, that's a great word. I love it. So Stay, I'm, yeah, and and from, I'm I'm not I'm not an expert on race. Yeah, I'm not. It, I I can talk about African American biblical interpretation. Yeah, and I can talk about how the New Testament, as best as I can understand it, addresses issues of the day. But when it talks about like you know, there's certain elements of kind of the secular race conversation yeah. that I'm still coming up to speed on. For, for me, and for me, I, I don't like love what you said, Sander Lane. Um, it's taken me a long time to discover that. And I, I have no interest, like you said, in, in in being kind of some kind of voice on these issues, which I never, it's not, I would need to go away and study it for 10 years. Um, for, it's more for my own as I'm processing thinking um, even helping yeah. my kids, you know, I've got three teenagers, you know, and they're asking questions, working through this. So it is more of a admittedly, I like, non- I like to give, what's that? So I like to give a taxonomy and this would actually help. This might help you. And it's, I put this in the book, but maybe it's probably even developed beyond the book. So I don't know if it's actually in this, there's kind of like four streams of what I kind of consider African-American kind of hermeneutical models. Mm-hmm. And the first one, I want to say, and just to kind of help people to kind of put people in buckets, at least the race from the Christian tradition, kind of like the black, kind of radical black slash black nationalist tradition. Mm-hmm. You think of someone who, who, um, so that's kind of like, you think of James Cone mm-hmm. or someone like that, who's kind of very critical of the United States, um, very critical about injustice and racism, has a certain way of articulating kind of the response to these things. And on the other spectrum, on the other side of the spectrum, is kind of what I like to call black accommodationalist. 
And these are the people who kind of repeat the talking points of majority culture. These are the people who are often cited against James Cone. Said, okay, James Cone says this. Here's a black Christian who says all of these things are false. Mm-hmm. You kind of move in from that, and you would say, well, there's kind of this black, and they, they may seem similar. This is the hardest one for like like white Christians to understand. This between like the black radical tradition and the black revolutionary tradition. Mm-hmm. I talk about the revolutionary tradition. I would say something like Frederick Douglass or maybe even Martin Luther King, who are equally critical of the United States, who are equally strong about racism but who propose a different set of solutions Mm -hmm. and have a slightly different theological framework. Mm -hmm. On the other end, there's kind of like black, what I call black pietist. A black pietist isn't going to be super like vocal about injustice, but they will kind of acknowledge racism, but they're more focused on kind of personal relationship with Jesus going to heaven when you die. And it takes a lot to kind of get a black pietist to join with the revolutionary tradition. And so if you think about like these kind of, systems they don't actually follow like theologically from left to right like evangelicalism but it's like different modes of being mm-hmm. black accommodationalist black pietist black revolutionaries and then black um uh radicals and so this spectrum is kind of like the the, the realm within which you see christians operate and what tends to happen in evangelicalism is they read they read accommodationalist maybe even pietist yeah. because they're not very challenging and they lump all of black kind of radicalism and black revolutionary theology into the same category when sometimes there's different theological frames and emphases that are more than just the difference between one and two. What I'm saying is that like people tend to think that there's, it's, it's a pole, yeah. but it's actually a spectrum. Oh, yeah. And so understanding like as I read, what tradition is this person coming from and who are their conversation partners? And why am I either put off or push back on those? Like, how am I responding to these because of my social location? Mm-hmm. And so understanding those traditions allows you not to embarrass yourself. Because what, what tends to happen is evangelicals, for the most part, don't really know black radicals. They don't because black radicals are so separate from their conversations that they're not even listening to them. They're not even engaged in like white evangelicalism. They think white evangelicalism is all white supremacists and, and just not worth their time. So what they do is they find the closest kind of black revolutionary tradition to them. And they yell at this black person over and over again, over again. They just basically harass this person and say, "What well, you're actually a black radical. And they go, well, no, I'm not. I mean, I know the black radicals. I talk to them. We engage in the conversation, but I'm not them. I'm here. And then white evangelicals are like, no, 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 you're not. Yeah. You're there. And so like, <laughs> and then and what tends to happen is that more and more black Christians go, you know what? It's not worth me even talking yeah. to you because you don't hear me. And so uh, put in and, and the other thing that happens is like, sorry, this is like when white evangelicals start reading, because there's not a lot of like the spectrum of black writing isn't in print, they kind of jump over the that tradition and go to black radicalism too. Now, uh, uh, radicalism, progressivism, whatever you want to whatever term you want to use to describe it. I'm not saying there's not a part of the black church tradition or it's not a part of the black Christian tradition. What I'm saying is it's one particular stream and that what we need in the same way that we have a spectrum of voices that are engaged in the exegetical process mm-hmm. in white Christianity mm-hmm. in white Christian spaces, we need a diversity of voices going through the exegetical process in black Christian spaces. Yeah, that's good. And helping your kids understand that is to help them because the like kids don't really understand. They just kind of put people in in, mm-hmm. in buckets. And it's like it's like some people go like, oh, like, well, N.T. Wright and John Piper don't go in the same bucket, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and N.T. Wright has this genealogy. Yeah. And he's actually different than Richard Hayes. Yeah. Sorry, this might be too much for the Bible scholar, but not Bible scholar. Nah, my, my you see how understanding. You see what I mean? Yeah. So you can say there's there's there, there there's Barkley, there's Wright, mm-hmm. there's like you know Hayes, there's um, J. Louis Martin, may he rest in peace. All of these people yeah, yeah. who re- who give birth to schools that are in dialogue with one another. Yeah. And understanding this is pivotal to understanding the exegetical process. Process in the same way, Black Christianity is a multifaceted, complex thing mm-hmm. that you can't understand by reading one book from each camp. Or three books from one camp and then one group from the other poll. That's usually what happens. It's the two polls to get read and none of the stuff in the middle. I've been enjoying like several good YouTube conversations where you have a diversity of perspectives dialoguing. There you just get the raw, kind of unfiltered, uncut, get you know, 
Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's been helpful. I, one more. I, I, you got to go eat lunch, man. I, but, uh, yes. I, just one quick question I've been wanting to ask you in the last 10 minutes as you're talking. Is it, um, okay. Is it insulting? Maybe not insulting, but maybe naive or maybe it is insulting when white people assume like you're an expert on race relations or like, Hey, you're black. Tell us what's going on in the world today. You know, or is that actually like, how do you feel when people kind of assume that you're an expert on race relations? Well, I think, I think that what black Christians, or at least I am called to do is to be both a scholar and a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a writer, we're writing about these problems. We're trying to think about these problems. We're trying to give an, a theological account. So what people then say, okay, if you've raised the problem, now fix it in an hour conversation. Well, hold on. Like, that's not my, like, you know, there's, there's doctors who do research and doctors who do surgery. You don't tell the doctor at the end of the surgery, at the end of research, now come cut my heart open and fix my heart. No, 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 no. Like, here's the data. Now that data has to go to the practitioners. And so, or people, so, so it's like people think that the only way that your criticism is significant is if you have the solution and you can say, explain to me how I can fix this problem. So what I want to say is that there's an assumption of omnicompetence and there's an assumption of limited competence. That sounds like they're in contradiction, but this is what I mean. Omnicompetence is we can go from diagnosis to cure to praxis in an hour hmm. and, it's, and that's what we can do. Yeah. But we're also limited to that expertise. So I have a PhD in New Testament. So I know New Testament scholarship. I've written stuff about Paul. I have a dissertation and nobody reads about Paul. And people assume that the only thing that I could talk about are issues related to race and ethnicity. So you're both omnicompetent on issues of race and of no competence on issues not related specifically to race. And so the freedom to move freely in and out of those conversations are difficult. So some African-Americans avoid it because they think, well, if I speak about it, this is the only thing that people ask me to speak about. So they kind of, in order to have the freedom to be, to do other things, they kind of limit it. I tend to say, well, I'm going to talk about it as much as I want to talk about it. And when I'm done, I'm done. Um, I tell people on the internet, you get two replies in a tweet. After that, you need to take my class. (laughs) I don't, I don't, ex- I, I don't give theological education for free on the internet. <laughs> Esau, thanks so much for being on Theology and Raw. I really appreciate you, your work, your voice. Uh, keep up the good work, man. Uh, really thankful for you. And um, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll have you on again sometime. We can just talk about Pauline scholarship. How's that? <laughs> yes. Hopefully I can get back to reading some good Pauline scholarship. This has been a hectic summer. Thank right. you for having me. God bless you all. Don't email me. Goodbye. <laughs>